Thomas P. Oyster Burns was born September 6, 1864 in Brooklyn, New York to Irish immigrant parents Patrick and Mary Burns. Burns began his professional baseball career with Harrisburg of the Minor League Interstate Association as an outfielder and a pitcher. Burns would be no stranger to controversy and confrontation throughout his career. Teammates would state that Burns had an irritating voice, and they would refer to him as a disturber, and had a bad disposition that made it unpleasant for any of the boys who crested him. He is what you call a bulldozer. In the Wednesday, August 1st, 1883 edition of the Harrisburg Telegraph, in a section called On the Rampage, it states that, Yesterday afternoon, coming down from the baseball match, a number of roughs made an assault on Blakely, the pitcher of the Harrisburg club, and struck him in the face. Burns, another pitcher of the Harrisburg club, happening along, was informed of the circumstance, and he proceeded to knock out the rough in short order. Other roughs crowded around when Burns and Blakely polished off the crowd, leaving four of them with well-developed mansard roofs over their eyes. Later in the evening, Burns had a row with his boarding house landlord, Alonzo Brady, of South 2nd Street, but did not get the best of him. Burns and Brady came to blows, and when the baseballist had the landlord down, a young man rushed in and hit Burns on the head, at the same time trying to drag him from Brady's prostrate form. Burns got up, but his second antagonist had escaped. It is said a suit for assault against the ball player will grow out of this second fight, which will develop some racy evidence. Burns would finish the 1883 season with a batting average of 220 in 69 games and an ERA of 2.3, pitching in over 20 games, 15 of which were starts. Burns would begin the 1884 season with the Wilmington Quick Steps. Not one to shy away from speaking his mind, in the Tuesday, May 27, 1884 edition of the News Journal, it was reported that Burns was not a favorite. He objected to Murphy's overhand delivery, caused a re-measurement of the distance from the plate to the pitcher's box, and at various times had advice for the umpire. In justice to him, it must be said that the box was found about a foot nearer the plate than it should have been. Burns would leave the Wilmington Quick Steps that season after they joined the Union Association. In a Tuesday, September 18, 1884 edition of the Daily Republican, it states that, Soon after entering the Union, the trouble began by Burns, Casey, Nolan, and Cusick jumping their contracts and leaving the club in the lurch, which so demoralized it that they lost one game and another in quick succession. At the time of his departure, Burns was making $150 per month. Burns would join the Baltimore Orioles of the American Association, playing right field and was the youngest player on the roster. The Baltimore Sun on Monday, August 25, 1884, reported in the Orioles' win over the Alleghenies that Burns, the new player, covered second base very well and kept his reputation as a slugger by making a home run and a three-base hit. Burns would go on to hit 298 in 35 games with six home runs, six triples, and an OPS plus of 181. The 1885 season would see Burns return to the Orioles, primarily in right field as well as a part-time pitcher, the only significant time he would see at the position in his major league career. Burns would end the season with the last place Orioles with a 231 batting average over 78 games, and his pitching was erratic as he ended the campaign with a 7-4 record and a 3.58 ERA over 105.2 innings and 19 wild pitches. This performance would lead to Burns being demoted to the Newark Domestics for the 1886 season. Burns would lead the Domestics to the Eastern League pennant while batting 352, slugging 558, and hitting 10 home runs. The bounce back season in Newark would lead Burns back to Baltimore for the 1887 season after a legal battle over his double contract signing with New York and Baltimore and would begin the season as the captain. In a Wednesday, June 15, 1887 edition of the Baltimore Sun, it states that Robinson, Bashong, and King had already crossed home plate. Latham stole third and scored on a pass ball. Four runs were in and but one hand out. This was too much. Burns could not stand it. He went into the pitcher's box, sending Kilroy to left field and Summer going to short. Burns struck Gleason out and O'Neill hit a high foul, which Fulmer got, ending the slaughter. Burns' reputation as a disturber persisted as he would lose his captaincy after throwing a ball at the opposing pitcher following a ground out, and once Burns caught teammate Tom Daly dozing in the outfield between games of a doubleheader, and he stabbed Daly in the leg with his penknife, 
Daly awoke suddenly, turning the blade and severing a tendon. Despite the tumultuous and short-lived captaincy of Oyster Burns, the Baltimore Orioles would improve in 1887 to a 77-58 record, good for third in the American Association, with Burns contributing a 341 batting average, a league-leading 19 triples, to go with 9 home runs, a career-high 58 stolen bases, a career-high 122 runs, and an OPS plus of 164 in a league-leading 140 games played. The 1888 season would see Burns split time between Baltimore and the Brooklyn Bridegrooms. Burns would bat 298 with an OPS plus of 158 in 79 games with Baltimore until Burns stated in the Saturday, September 8, 1888 edition of the Baltimore Sun that, I made the change to oblige Mr. Barney, who told me that his club was losing money this season. He pleaded with me that I was a high-priced man he could dispose of me to advantage to Brooklyn. I replied that if I could benefit myself as well as him, I would go to Brooklyn, and my release was given me. I immediately signed with Brooklyn at an increase of $500 in salary, Mr. Barney getting $3,500 for my release. There is one thing, however, that I do not like in Barney. By the papers I see that he is spreading the report that I am a disorganizer and was the chief of the Newark clique that went to Baltimore two seasons ago. Mr. Barney will find that the Baltimore people appreciate me and my playing, even if he does not. I want to say right here that the Baltimore club will never be much of a success as long as Mr. Barney is at the head of it. Burns would finish the 1888 season in 52 games with Brooklyn, hitting 284 with an OPS plus of 141. Baltimore would finish fifth in the American Association with a 57 and 80 record, while Brooklyn took second place with an 88 and 52 record. Playing in a new home in 1889, Burns, still only 24 years old, would have an excellent season with the Bridegrooms, hitting 304 with 100 RBI, 5 home runs, and 13 triples, and an OPS plus of 137. Brooklyn would go on to win the American Association pennant with a 93 and 44 record. Brooklyn would go on to face the New York Giants in the World Series, the first involving solely New York teams. The Giants won this best of 11 game series 6 games to 3. Brooklyn would transfer to the National League following the 1889 season. Burns would go on to have one of his best offensive seasons in 1890, batting 284 and leading the league in home runs with 13 and RBI with 128, with an OPS plus of 138 in only 119 games, leading Brooklyn to its second straight pennant. The 1890 World Series would see Brooklyn face the Louisville Colonels of the American Association. The series would end in a 3-3-1 tie with the championship game to be held the following spring, but this would never materialize, as disputes between the NL and AA during the winter about the redistribution of players following the dissolution of the Players League would persist and the American Association would end its relationship with the National League before the spring of 1891. In 1891, the Bridegrooms would shorten their name to the Grooms, and Burns would continue playing well offensively, showing less power but still a respectable 285 batting average with 4 home runs, 83 RBI, and an OPS plus of 128. Brooklyn would finish 6th in the National League with a record of 61 and 76. 1892 would be another excellent offensive season for Burns. With the Grooms, he batted 315 with 4 home runs, 96 RBI, and an OPS plus of 159 in 141 games. Brooklyn would improve to 95 and 59, but that was only good for third place in the National League with the Boston Bean Eaters, led by legendary Hall of Fame pitcher Kid Nichols, winning the pennant with a 102 and 48 record, besting the Cleveland Spiders 5, 0, and 1 in the 1892 World Series. Burns would see a drop in his batting average to 270 during the 1893 season with Brooklyn, but his overall numbers continued their steady production with 7 home runs, 60 RBI, and an OPS plus of 102. In a Wednesday, June 28th edition of the Brooklyn Eagle, it reported that the Rooters at home may put down Mr. Thomas Oyster Burns as the only original profit of the baseball diamond. With the score at 8-0 after the first half of the interval, Burns turned to the jeering populace and with a voice inspired and shouted, Hear ye, ye Chicago hirelings, ye may shout about the prowess of your fair, and my feet are bulbous from its paths, but your ball team is not in it with us. We've won lots of games like this this summer and we'll win this. You see if we don't. 
There was such an air of confidence about this harangue that the boys took heart, and from the first inning Brooklyn did all the batting. It was a glorious victory gained by hard hitting and good base running. Despite this mid-season bravado, the grooms would end the season in 7th place in the National League with a record of 65 and 63. The 1894 season would see Burns achieve the best batting average of his career with a 355 mark with 5 home runs, 109 RBI, and an OPS plus of 126. In a September 4, 1894 edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, after an incredible game from Burns, it was reported that a home run capped the climax in the 8th, and both Pavilion and Bleachers arose as one man, and amid waving of hats shouted the well-known shout, What's the matter with Burns? He's all right. It was then and not till then that Tommy doffed his cap. The grooms would finish 1894 fifth in the National League with a 70-61 and 61 record. 1895 would be Burns' final major league season as he split time between Brooklyn and the New York Giants. Burns would play poorly for Brooklyn in 20 games batting only 184 before being released. The Giants picked him up and he performed well for them in 33 games, batting 307. In a match between Brooklyn and New York after Burns had joined the Giants, it is reported in the Sunday, August 18, 1895 edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle that the judgment of President Byrne in releasing Tom Burns was clearly shown. The ex-Brooklyn player went to bat three times but failed to reach first. In 1896, Burns' contract was purchased by the minor league Newark Colts. Burns led the Colts to the Atlantic League pennant with an 82-61 and record, batting 378 on the season. The local press was not kind to Burns as it was reported on Thursday, May 7, 1896, that Tom Burns did not play in the game yesterday. He sat on the bench grumbling like an old woman without a cup of tea. In 1897, Burns would join the Colts' rival, the Hartford Bluebirds, as a player coach, where he led the team in doubles and batting average. Burns' fiery nature was still intact as it was reported in the Thursday, September 2, 1897 edition of the Hartford Current that Wentz bunted safe and Burns threw wild to third. Wheel came home. Burns claimed Wheel cut second. Mack protested and was put out of the game, whereupon Burns called his men off, refusing to play. The game was awarded to Norfolk by a score of 9-0. Burns would manage his final season in 1901 with the Portland Maine team of the New England League and would go on to become a fiery umpire in the National League. Burns passed away on November 11, 1928 in Brooklyn, New York. In an article in the Monday, November 12, 1928 edition of the Brooklyn Eagle, his life, and especially his later life, was summed up perfectly. Tom Burns is dead. Tom Burns, one of the few surviving members of the old guard of the early 90s who played ball for the fun of it, that rough and ready band who fought each other and the umpires on the diamond, and then four gathered at the nearby cafes to discuss baseball topics over frothy steins in peace and goodwill. Burns was a member of the Brooklyn team that won the National League pennant in 1890. He stuck to the old organization in the Brotherhood War with such noted players as Davey Fouts, Hub Collins, George Pinckney, Germany e. Smith, Darby O'Brien, Tom Daly, still a resident of Brooklyn, Doc Bashong, Bob Carruthers, and Adonis Terry. He was perhaps the most aggressive player of his day, and while a member of the Baltimores just prior to his purchase by Brooklyn was known as Oyster Burns and Burns the Bully. After his playing days as an outfielder and hard hitter were over, Burns was appointed a National League umpire and stirred up almost as much excitement as when he wore the spangles and spike shoes. He was especially a bone of contention when he was assigned to the polo grounds and was almost the victim of a serious injury when a New York catcher sidestepped a fast pitch ball. Tom ducked in the nick of time. He resigned shortly after that episode. Later, Burns opened a cafe at the corner of DeKalb Avenue and Emerson Place, this borough, and at the period of his career was one of the few men to have the distinction of reading his own obituary. Tom Burns, one time third baseman of the Chicago Nationals, had been called out by the great umpire. Some of the sports writers mistook him for the famous Brooklyn outfielder and sang his praises to the extent of the columns. The writer visited Burns at his cafe in order to verify the tale. The writer had mixed up which Thomas Burns he was supposed to write the obituary for, and found him distributing free lunch to half a hundred workmen from the neighboring shops. A few years ago, he became a corporation inspector for the city, with which he was connected at the time of his death. 
He survived a serious operation last year, but a month ago had a stroke of paralysis that resulted in his death at the Victory Memorial Hospital yesterday morning. Always a resident of Brooklyn since he quit baseball, Burns had his own home at 265 71st Street, Bay Ridge. Rough and ready on the ball field, Burns was ever a good provider for his family, and his home was a model of happiness and comfort. He was a lover of flowers, much of his leisure time being spent in his backyard cultivating row upon row of all sorts of horticultural beauties. Burns was 64 years old at the time of his death. He is survived by his wife Emma DeVoe Burns and a married son Edward, who lives at Hartford, Connecticut, and whom his father never failed to visit half a dozen times a year. Services will be held Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock in the Church of Our Lady of Angels, 4th Avenue and 74th Street, Brooklyn. Thomas P. Oyster Burns was a disturber, a bulldozer, a competitor, and most of all a caring person who played the game he loved until he no longer could. A career 300 hitter with 1,392 hits, 870 runs, 129 triples, and an OPS plus of 135 over 11 years. Burns was a prolific hitter in the early days of the game. A baseball life like no other, and a perfect reminder to always stop and smell the roses.